Guys, starting on our semester review. Number one, it says the monument has a height of 492 feet, three inches. Express this height in meters. Main thing here is we're just working on converting everything. Um, what we're given is feet, we're going to meters, so we need a conversion factor for feet to meters and inches to meters. Um, and we looked that up and we know that one foot equals 0 0.305 meters and one inch equals um, 0 0.0254 meters. So we can set these up and all we're going to do is we're going to solve for feet to meters and then solve for inches to meters and just add those together. So when we set it up what we'll see is that we have 492 feet. Um, you can set it up with the boxes like this uh, if you want. Um, but what you're going to have is you're going to have one foot on the bottom and then your 0 0.305 meters on top and then we'll get that answer. Uh, we'll add it to the three inches which inches go on the bottom opposite box. We have 0 0.0254 meters. Add those together and we should get an answer of right around 150.038 meters. Working number two out and says a pyramid has a height of 482 feet and its base covers 13 acres. The pyramid contains approximately, it gives us 3.15 times 10 to the 6 stone blocks with an average of 1.53 tons. Okay. It says find the weight of the pyramid. It wants us to find it in pounds. Okay, so the main thing here is all we have to start with is we just have to start with 3.15 times 10 to the 6 stones. Okay, and when we set it up, we know that um, one stone is going to equal, on an average, 1.53 tons. And one ton equals uh, 2,000 pounds. And all we have to do is we just multiply the top 3.15 times 10 to the 6 times 1.35 times 2,000 pounds. Um, and that will give us our answer. All right, guys, here it says um, a car starts from rest and accelerates for 6.5 seconds with an acceleration of 1.65 meters per second squared. Um, it says how far does the car travel? So on this one, we are solving for distance. Um, we can do if that. Sorry, I forgot my initial velocity. Um, we have our initial velocity, which is going to be zero. Um, and we have a distance is what we're solving for. We have an acceleration of 1.6 um, meters per second squared, and we have a time of 6.5 seconds. So we're gonna use the equation that doesn't have the final velocity, which that equation is distance equals our initial velocity times time plus one half our acceleration times time squared. Okay, so we'll get a distance equaling our initial velocity of zero, so that's going to be zero. Anything times zero is zero, so one half our acceleration, which is going to be 1.6 meters per second squared, times our time of 6.5 seconds squared, and we should get a distance of right around 33.8 meters. Okay guys, uh, here, number four, it says the barrel of a rifle has a length of, it gives us a length, a bullet travels, um, or leaves the muzzle of the rifle with a speed of, yay, gave us that. What is the acceleration of the bullet while in the barrel? A bullet in the rifle barrel does not have a constant acceleration, but constant acceleration is to be assumed for the problem. Okay, main thing here, we're doing if that as well, okay. Things that we have straight from the problem that we can use 
Um, it gives us a length, which is a distance. We have 0 0.972 meters. Um, and it also gives us a 629 meters per second. It leaves the barrel. So it wants to know what is the acceleration of the bullet while in the barrel. So the distance that we have is the, the barrel. And this is going to be our final velocity, 629 meters per second. Now, a bullet at rest, obviously, is going to be zero. So it starts at zero meters per second, goes to 629 meters per second in this distance. We're solving for acceleration, so we're using the equation that does not have time. So the equation that we're going to use on your formula chart is where we have acceleration equals our final velocity squared minus our initial velocity squared all over 2d. So when we plug this in, we're solving for acceleration. Our final velocity is going to be 629 squared minus a 0 squared is 0, all divided by 2 times our distance, which our distance is 0 0.972 meters. And we should get an acceleration of right around 2.03519 times 10 to the fifth and that's an acceleration so therefore it's meters per second squared. Okay guys from here it says an automobile with initial speed of 4.51 meters per second accelerates uniformly at a rate of 3.3 meters per second squared. Find the final speed of the car after five seconds. So we have our if that A, our initial speed is going to be 4.51 meters per second. It gives us an acceleration, which our acceleration is going to be 3.3 meters per second squared. Um, it wants us to find the final velocity. It also gives us a time of 5.0 seconds. So we're using the equation that does not have distance. So we have acceleration equals our final velocity minus our initial velocity all over time. Okay, we're solving for the final velocity, so therefore, solve it algebraically. We multiply these two, and we get acceleration times time equals our final velocity minus our initial velocity. Solve for this. We bring initial velocity to the other side. We'll have acceleration times time plus our initial velocity equals our final velocity. And all we have to do is we take these, plug them in acceleration of 3.3. Uh, we have a time of 5.0 plus our initial velocity of 4.5 meters per second equals our final velocity and we should get an answer right around 21.01 um, .01 meters per second. Moving on to part two of the same question. Um, here, uh, basically, since you solved in the last question, you can use any, um, any equation that has din or displacement because we're finding the displacement after five seconds. Uh, but what I'm going to use is I'm going to keep my values the same, and I'm going to use my, um, we have if that. Okay, and I have my initial velocity, which is going to be 21.01 .01 meters per second. Um, I'm going to have solving for my displacement, have an acceleration of 3.3 .3 meters per second squared, and have a time of 5 seconds. Um, so I'm going to use the one that doesn't have final velocity, which I know that that equation is going to be displacement equals the initial velocity times time plus one-half a t squared. Uh, plugging this in, we have a displacement of, uh, or sorry, we're solving for displacement. We have an initial velocity of 21.01 .01 meters per second um, times by time of five seconds plus one-half of my acceleration, which is 3.3 meters per second squared um, times my time of five seconds squared. Okay, these are my variables. All we got to do from here is just multiply them out, add them together, and we'll get our displacement.
All right, guys, moving on to number seven. It says consider position of the ball thrown down with initial uh, speed of 23 meters per second. Um, what, it, what will uh, its position be after 3.5 seconds? And let the initial position be zero, the acceleration of gravity. Uh, so when we're working this one out, we have um, if that again. Okay, it does give us uh, an initial velocity of 23 meters per second. Um, it gives us uh, what would the position be after 3.5 seconds, so it gives us a time. Um, we also have an acceleration, which we know that our acceleration is going to be negative um, 9.8 meters per second squared. And then we are solving for the displacement. So we're going to use the equation that doesn't have final velocity. Uh, when we plug this in, um, we always have our distance equals our initial velocity times time plus one half a t squared. And all we're doing here is we're just plugging our variables into our equation. Okay, and we should get an answer right around close to um, negative 140.525 meters. All right, guys, moving on to number eight. It says consider the position of the ball thrown up with initial speed of 23 meters per second. Um, what will its position be after 3.5 seconds? So we're going straight up and down, so we have an initial velocity of 23 uh, meters per second. Uh, we always have acceleration due to gravity, which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, we also have a time of 3.5 seconds. And we are solving for the height, which in this place is a position. It's going to be our displacement, which is, that's our question mark. So we're using the equation that doesn't have final velocity, which is displacement equals our initial velocity times time plus one half a t squared, same equation that we've been using in, in basically everything so far. Uh, make sure that all we do is we just take these numbers and plug them into our equation. Um, and then we would get our answer, which our answer should be right around 20.475 meters. All right, uh, dealing basically with the exact same problem, number nine, it says a bullet is fired straight up from a gun with a muzzle velocity of 128 meters per second. So we have an initial velocity of 128 meters per second. Um, neglecting air resistance, what will its displacement be after we have a time of 7.3 seconds? Uh, the acceleration of gravity we always know is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, it wants to know what will its displacement be, so we're solving for D. We're going to use the equation that we've been using, displacement equals our initial velocity times time plus one half a t squared. Um, and guys, again, all we're doing is we're plugging in and solving for displacement. It's already done algebraically for us. Uh, so again, just plugging in our variables into the equation and plugging all that into a calculator. We should get an answer right around 673.279 meters because that bullet is traveling rather quickly. All right guys, moving on to the next one. Um, this one's a little bit different. We have been previously talking about uh, motion basically going up and down or backwards and forwards. And now um, we have an angle thrown into the problem so it's gonna be a little bit different. Okay, it says an artillery shell is fired at an angle of 30.8 degrees above horizontal ground with initial speed of 1660 meters per second. The acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Find the total time of the flight of the shell. Now the first thing that we have to do is we have to break everything up into our components, X and Y components. Um, main thing here is we have to find our initial velocity and it gives us the initial velocity basically at an angle which is 30.8 degrees uh, here but we want to find the motion in the y um, and in the x okay basically all we need is we need the y but realize that we can break it up into the y and the x 
Okay, so we're finding the velocity right here for the y. So to do this, uh, we're going to use our SOHCAHTOA. Um, and the main thing here, this is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Our hypotenuse is going to be 1660 meters per second, which is our initial velocity um, or our overall velocity. Okay, so here, uh, setting it up, what we'll have is we'll have the sine of 30, oops, sorry, 30.8, don't get confused by that, equals our opposite, which is our y velocity, all over our hypotenuse of 1660 meters per second. Uh, multiply those two, uh, the sine of 30.8 times 16.60, or 1660, and we get our y velocity, which we should have a velocity of right around 849.99 uh, meters per second, and that is the velocity in the y direction. So everything that we're thinking about is in the y direction. Uh, we have our initial velocity, so if we're doing if that, Using this, we have our initial velocity of 849.99 meters per second. Um, main thing here, we have, we're solving for the final total time. So we're solving for time. We have acceleration of 9.8 uh, meters per second squared. And uh, main thing here is we don't have anything else on our problem to really tell us um, what we're dealing with. So the main thing that we got to do is we have to look at our problem and when it's set up we see that we have our parabola as it's moving and it's set up like this um, and main thing that we can look at is if we know our initial velocity what we can do is we can take the parabola and we can basically chop it in half and at the very top of its peak at the very height of its height at halfway we know that it's going to have a final velocity of zero meters per second okay because anytime we throw an object straight up in the air, it gets up into the air and at the very highest point, it's going to have a zero velocity. It's not going to be going up, it's not going to be going down. It has zero velocity. Okay, So we can use this and we're breaking it up in half. But the main thing when we do this, we have to make sure that we multiply our time at the very end by two because it, it's asking us for the total time of the flight. Uh, so we're setting it up. We're saying that our final velocity is zero. Again, in the end, we're going to multiply it by two. So we go ahead and we see the equation that we're going to be using is the equation that does not have our um, displacement. So the equation that we're going to be using uh, is going to be our acceleration equals our final velocity minus our initial velocity all over time. Okay, we're solving for time algebraically. We just switch those up, and we have time equals our final velocity, which our final velocity is going to be zero, uh, minus our initial velocity, which is 849.99 meters per second, all divided by gravity, which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, the main thing here, the negatives cancel out. We can never have a negative time. So if you did end up getting a negative time, you might want to go back and check it. Okay, we calculate this out, and we will get it in seconds. Okay, now realize that we have to multiply this by 2, um, our answer by 2, so we can get it for the entire time. And then it's asking us to, in the unit of minutes, so multiply it by 2, uh, divide by 60 to get it into minutes, and we should get an answer right around 2.8. Uh, 9113 minutes. All right, moving on to number 11. It says find the horizontal range neglecting air resistance. So the main thing here, um, we found the time in uh, the previous problem. We found it in minutes. Um, and we know that our initial velocity, again, is going to be 1660 at a 30.8 degree angle. So the main thing here is we're solving for the x velocity. Uh, so we're going to use the cosine of 30.8 times our initial velocity of 1660, or our overall velocity. And that's going to give us our velocity in the x direction, which should be 1425.87 meters per second. And that's our velocity in the x direction. Now, the only equation that we use in the x direction is velocity equals displacement or distance over time. 
Um, that's the only equation that we're using here. And we have time from the previous problem. We know that the time is going to be 2.89113 minutes, which is we're going to use our speed is in meters per second. So we need that in seconds. So all we do is we multiply it by 60, and we get 173.4678 for our time. So we have time. We have our velocity in the x direction. We can solve for our range, which is our distance. So distance equals our velocity times time. So we're going to have 1425.87. Uh, that multiplied by our time of 173.4678, and we oops, should be in parentheses, and we should get an answer right around uh, 247,331 and 0.41 meters, uh, which it wants in kilometers. So we go ahead and we divide by a thousand um, to get our answer, and if we divide by a thousand we will get it in kilometers, which it should be if we divide by 1,000, just move it three places over, uh, 247.331 kilometers. All right, guys, uh, moving on to 12. It says the bomber flies horizontally with a speed of 179 meters per second relative to the ground. The altitude of the bomber is 1890 meters, and the terrain is level. Neglecting the effects of air resistance, we have acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. It says how far from the point vertically under the point of release does the bomb hit on the ground? So we have our plane is flying in this direction, and basically when we let it go, at a certain point it's going to land over here. Okay, so the main thing we have to do is we have to figure out from that point when we let it go what happens. So the main thing we have. Um, that we're dealing with is that we have an x velocity but we don't have a y velocity that's the main thing that we have to take from this problem uh, breaking everything up into x and y components uh, main thing that we know since it's traveling horizontally we're not going up and down at all that means our initial velocity in our y direction is going to be zero meters per second um, it tells us our velocity in the x direction, which is 179 meters per second. Um, other things that it tells us, it gives us the height of the plane. Uh, so we know that that is the distance in the uh, y direction, which is 1890 meters per, or sorry, just meters, because it's a distance. Um, and it gives us an acceleration uh, of 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, main thing here is the only equation that we can use in the x direction is velocity equals distance over time. So main thing is we don't have anything else in the x direction to solve for, so we have to solve for time in the y direction, uh, and then that's the only variable that goes back and forth. So when we're looking at this, doing if that, we have initial, we have distance, we have acceleration, we have uh, time, we're going to solve for time. We use the equation where we have distance equals our initial velocity. And since our initial velocity is zero, I'm not going to write it. So our initial velocity times time, uh, which is zero, plus one half our acceleration, which is 9.8 uh, meters per second squared. And we have a distance um, of 1890 uh, meters. So when we go ahead and we plug our 1890 in here, and what we see we're going to do is we're going to get 4.9 from this uh, and we'll have 1890 we divide both sides by 4.9 to get that equals time squared uh, and we take the square root of this uh, to get us time which we know that um, that time is going to be 19.714 and that would be seconds and so therefore we have time now, we can plug it in over here, uh, 19.714 seconds. We solve for distance, uh, which our distance is going to be our velocity times time, so 179 uh, meters per second times our 19.714 seconds. We go ahead and work that out, and we should get a distance right around 3,528.81 meters for our distance in the x direction.
Moving on, part two of this problem. So we have the information that we had before. It says, at what angle from the vertical um, at the point of release must the telescopic uh, bomb site be set so that the bomb hits the target seen in the site at the time of release? Main thing here we're, we're looking for is that we're setting it up and basically we have from vertical and they set the lens at an angle so that it'll hit um, the target because it's going to travel horizontally as it goes down. So when we're looking at it like this, um, we have our height, which our height is going to be 1890 meters. Um, and then we know that our x direction, which we found in the previous problem, was um, 3200 or 3528. 0.81, and what we're solving for is we're solving for this angle right here. Okay, we're solving for that theta. Uh, main thing here is that we have our opposite and our adjacent, so we're going to be using the tangent function. Uh, tangent of theta equals our um, opposite over our adjacent. So main thing here, when we solve for theta, uh, we're going to do the inverse tangent, so the inverse tangent function which on your calculator should just be t second tangent uh, divided by our opposite of 3528.81 all divided by 1890 and we plug this into the calculator and we should get a theta right around 61.82 uh, degrees. Make sure that when you're plugging this in your calculator make sure you have it in. On uh, we see number 14 it says a ball at the end of the string with a 2 meters uh, we know a radius is 2 meters at a constant speed. It has a horizontal circle. It makes uh, 7 revolutions per second. Uh, that means we have 7 revolutions per 1 second. What is the period of the ball? We know that the period is going to be time of a revolution. So we have 1 second per, per 7 revolutions, uh, which we get an answer of 0 0.142857. Per period. On the next one, number 15, it says, what is the frequency of the motion? Frequency always means how many revolutions per second. So we already said the revolutions per second were seven. Um, and that would be the answer. Okay, guys, now working on this one, it says, what is the angular velocity of the ball? Uh, main thing here is angular velocity when we're looking at it, um, or VT, um, or tangent of velocity is another way we can say it. If it wants it in radians per second, uh, main thing is going to be our angle all over our period. Uh, main thing here is our angle is going to be 2 pi, and then our uh, period is going to be 0 0.142857. Uh, um, and we work this out. We should get something right around 43 uh, radians per second, right around there. Uh, main thing here is if it wants in radians per second, we do angle over uh, the period. If we doesn't want, remember, if it gives us our radius and it wants it in meters per second, we would do 2 pi r all over our period for that. Number 17, it says, what is the angular speed in revolutions per minute? That's the main thing we got to pay attention uh, to there. Make sure we're realizing that it's revolutions per minute. That's the unit it wants it in. Um, is needed for uh, a centrifuge to produce an acceleration 507 times the gravitational acceleration at a radius of 13.4 centimeters. Uh, so the equation that we're going to use is centrifugal acceleration equals our angular or tangential velocity squared uh, times our radius. So we're solving for the speed, the angular speed. So we're solving for VT, which what we're going to end up getting is we're going to get end up getting our excel sorry our acceleration uh, divided by our radius take the square root of that and that will give us our uh, t and when we solve for this our vt which is our tangential velocity um, or our angular velocity when we solve for this what we're going to have set up is we'll have uh, the square root of 507 times 9.8 and we're dividing that uh, by our 0.134 uh, meters, change the centimeters to meters, uh, and we get our tangential velocity. Once we get that answer, that's going to be in radians per second, uh, which that answer will be 192.559 
radians per second, um, which when we solve it, we went in revolutions per second. So we know that there are 60 seconds in one minute. We can set it up like that. And we know that um, one revolution is going to equal two pi radians. So we work this out. Uh, make sure when you plug it in the calculator that you put two pi in parentheses. Uh, and we should get an answer right around 1838.80. Um, and that should be in revolutions per minute. What is the acceleration of a 43 kilogram block of cement when pulling sideways with a net force of 2200 newtons? Uh, equation here is force equals mass times acceleration. Um, so we have a force of 2200 newtons. We have a mass equaling 43 kilograms. We're solving for acceleration. Uh, so all we would get would be uh, 222 divided by uh, 43 kilograms, and we would get an acceleration of right around 5.16279, and that would be in meters per second squared. We have a sprint, uh, sprinting near the end of a race, a runner with a mass, it gives us a mass of 62 kilograms, accelerates us of speeds of 40 meters per second to a speed of 41 meters per second in 12 seconds to gain the speed the runner produces a backward force on the ground so that the ground pushes the runner forward providing the force necessary for the acceleration calculate this average force so the first thing we have to do is calculate acceleration acceleration equals the change in velocity all over time uh, so we have acceleration equals our final which is 41 meters per second minus 40 meters per second all over the time of 12 seconds and we would get an acceleration of right around 0 0.0833 and that's our acceleration so we know that force equals mass times acceleration and the force exerted by the runner uh, would be on the concrete so therefore it's the same we have a mass of 62 kilograms times our acceleration of 0 0.0833 so the, um, the ground uh, pushing the runner forward would have a force of 5.1667 newtons. All right, guys, moving on to the next one. We see that a hockey puck uh, is hit on a frozen lake and starts moving with a speed of 13.3 uh, meters per second. Exactly 4.1 seconds later, its speed is decreased to 6.40 meters per second. What's the average acceleration? Well, acceleration equals the change in velocity all over time. Oops, should be a lowercase t. Okay, so change in velocity equals our final minus our initial. So our final velocity is 6.40 minus our initial velocity of 13.3, all divided by a time of 4.10. And we see that its final velocity is lower, so therefore we have to have a deceleration. So it's going to be negative. 1.683 meters per second squared. Okay, guys, moving on to the second part of that problem. It says, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the puck and the ice? Main thing here is we just have to realize that the force that uh, is exerted by the puck to overcome the force of kinetic friction, they basically have the same thing except opposite. Um, so we have the force due to friction will be the opposite of the force exerted by the puck. So what we can say, the force of friction, we know that that equation equals the coefficient of kinetic friction uh, times the mass times gravity, and the force of the puck equals the mass of the puck times acceleration, which is the acceleration we found in the previous problem. So we see that mass is on both sides, so mass is basically just going to cancel out, and the mass doesn't really matter here. Uh, so the, the coefficient of friction equals... Um, times gravity equals the acceleration. So when we're solving for this, basically our equation that we're going to have it set up is the coefficient of kinetic friction equals uh, the opposite of our acceleration divided by gravity. Uh, so what we're going to see is we're going to see that this coefficient of kinetic friction um, is going to have a um, our acceleration, which is the opposite of that. So it's just going to be positive. It would be 1.683 all divided by gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared. And we should get an answer of right around 0 0.171552 for our uh, coefficient of kinetic friction.
22 is the last part of that problem. It says how far does the puck travel during the this 4.10 second interval. Uh, so in working the problem, we know that we have an acceleration that we found in the first part, which is 1.683 meters per second squared. Um, we're solving for distance. We have a time of 4.10 seconds, and we have an initial velocity of right around 13.3 meters per second. So we plug this into our equation where we have distance equals our initial velocity times time plus one half times our acceleration times time squared. So what we'll have plugging all this information in, and we have distance equals our initial velocity of 13.3 times our time of 4.10 seconds plus one half of our acceleration, which is going to be negative uh, 1.683 times our 4.1 squared. And that would give us our distance. All right, so moving on to 23-24. On this problem, it says a person uh, weighs 158 pounds. The acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, to determine the weight in newtons. A couple of different ways that you can work this out. Um, you could use a convergent factor where you have um, convert pounds into kilograms and then we know the force due to weight equals the mass which is kilograms times 9.8 or you could look up the convergent factor that said uh, one pound uh, equals 4.448 newtons uh, and then we all, have, all we have to do is convert pounds into newtons which we set that up we have one five eight uh, pounds and we go ahead and set that up where we have one pound equals four point four four eight newtons um, we work that out and we should get something right around uh, seven hundred and two point uh, right around six eight and that would be uh, newtons which is our force due to weight. And then in our next problem, it says uh, determine um, her mass in kilograms. Uh, when we're working this one out, all we would do is we have the force in newtons. So force equals mass times acceleration. So if we have the force due to weight, uh, we just divide it by the acceleration due to gravity to get, our, get the mass, which should be uh, 702.68, all divided by 9.81 meters per second squared and should give us a mass uh, right around um, 71.67 uh, kilograms. Right around there should be our answer. Alright guys, number 25 it says you hit someone with the force of 190 newtons. How much force is exerted on you? Uh, Newton's third law tells us that if we exert 190 newtons of force that um, that someone's going to exert 190 newtons of force back on us, so it's going to be the same. So the answer.